millennials want to do things now. They don't want to wait. They certainly don't want a career for 30 years and then stop it and go off on a cruise somewhere. I mean, they want to live their life now. I think the statistics is something like they'll have an average of 12 or 15 jobs in their lifetime. So it's just it, that whole aspect is very different. They're, they're very transient, I think, have a much shorter attention span. <laughs> and really want things now. Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Market Call Show. This is Louis Giannis. I am the founder of WealthNet Investments. Today, we have an interesting topic, and I'm really excited about diving in, so let's get going. Good morning, Shauna. How are you? I'm good, and yourself? Doing wonderful. I met Shauna Compton on a podcast, actually. She's the host of the Millennial Money Podcast, and she's a former financial advisor specializing in money issues for millennials. And I'm glad to have you on because I get a lot of questions about millennials and you're an expert in that area. You focus in that area. I'm actually curious before we get going, could you tell me a little bit about your journey prior to starting the podcast? Like, how did you wind up in that position? How did you start a podcast? What were your experiences beforehand to, to lead you there? It's a very good question. And as always, it's a very windy road. I started my first business actually when I was in college at 19 and that was actually the first national student film festival. And I ran that for five years and then ended up selling it to a Hollywood producer. So at that time, I kind of had this weird mix of all sorts of skills that I just didn't really know what to do with. But I went back and got an MBA and was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And my father's been in the financial industry his whole career, and he had a boutique wealth planning firm. And he's like, hey, would you want to come work with me? And let's just see, do you like it? Do you not like it? So day one, we were working with people who had $100 million in assets plus. And Whoa. so it was kind of like the greatest on the job lesson of wow. learning how to really work with wealth. We, I mean, we've worked with all sorts of different people, but I have this creative side in me. And so it started to come out. I started realizing that most of my MBA peers knew nothing about personal finance. So I started to do what I love, which is speak and write and teach and all sorts of things. And I ended up oddly enough being asked to be a professor at a university in Los Angeles to create my own financial literacy courses. So I just kind of created something that I would have wanted to learn myself when I was 18. And we don't use textbooks. We just use podcasts and videos and all sorts of things. And through that experience, I thought, you know what, I, I should try podcasting. So in 2015, before everyone got into podcasting, I started the show, really had no idea what I was doing, but here we are almost seven years later and we surpassed 20 million downloads. And I just... I love this form of mixing like entertainment with education. Very interesting. Very interesting. The creative side is so different in some people's minds, you know, between finances, there's like this dichotomy between finances and creativity, but in reality, they're not really that different, right? I mean, you, like yeah. solving problems, sometimes you need some creativity, but it's great that you found that niche. So you were a financial advisor, worked with lots of different clients. So how did you land on millennials specifically, like what <laughs> brought you there? Well, I'm a certified financial planner as well, but I'm non-practicing, but I myself was working with a lot of younger clients and I am in that weird place where depending on what article or survey you read, I'm in between a millennial and a Gen Xer. So I'm like right on that weird kind of cusp. So I had written an article about, I think it was like seven smart money moves to make in your twenties. And it just ended up going viral. And so I thought, okay, there must be something about this. Like people who are just like maybe a one or two years younger than I am and down from there. And so I don't know, again, this was kind of the wild, wild west of podcasting. And I have this marketing brain. I thought, okay, I need a good name for the show. And millennial money just kind of spoke to me. And so that's the genesis of how that name came to be. And 
now seven years later in late February, we're actually going to do a name change to go to even a wider audience and get out of that really firm millennial niche. But I've learned so much over the years about not only millennials, but younger generation and how they think about money and what they want to learn and all sorts of stuff. It's just, it's a really cool space to be in. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of things going through my brain while you're, let's define what millennial is. Cause I think some people get confused about what that is. Who is a millennial? Oh gosh, I forget the actual age. I think it's from 1980, 79, 78, somewhere in there is kind of the older end all the way down to, I think 2000 ish. Okay. Big, big Uh, range. Yeah. Somewhere in there, but the stats are the millennials are the largest generation. Again, you read a million different articles, you're going to hear a million different things. But this is really the generation who have grown up with email and they've grown up with cell phones and technology. And I think really looking at the world from a different lens, and I think it's a very different generation than even Gen Xers and of course, boomers and older. So they really are, I think, kind of pioneering some of these big tech movements. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg's a, a millennial and a lot of the tech startup owners are millennials. And I think they just saw technology and they just looked at the world and said, okay, so many things are just not the way we think they should be. (laughs) And money is another one. We've got digital banks. Now we just have all these apps that you can learn about money and manage your money and all sorts of things. It's just a whole different world. What would you say their biggest, you said millennials have a different lens that they look, what would you say the biggest lens difference is between the millennials and the boomers? Because when you think about wealth, Right now, I believe the boomers still have the vast majority of the wealth. Yes. But there's a big transition of wealth that's occurring right now. What would you say the biggest difference in the way they view the world versus a boomer, say? One, you can look at work-life balance. So millennials want to do things now. They don't want to wait. They certainly don't want a career for 30 years and then stop it and go off on a cruise somewhere. I mean, they want to live their life now. I think the statistics is something like they'll have an average of 12 or 15 jobs in their lifetime. So it's just that whole aspect is very different. They're they're very transient. I think have a much shorter attention span (laughs) and really want things now. They don't want to wait necessarily to build wealth. I mean, if we looked at the crypto boom and meme stocks and all of these different things that we've seen the last couple of years, It's millennials and younger, zennials or whatever they're called, the younger generations that are really like, no, we want to take advantage of this. If we want to build wealth, we don't want to have to work 40 hours a week for 50 years. We want to transform our lives now. And I think technology and education, all sorts of things are allowing that to happen. Now, they might not totally understand what to do with that money once they get that money, or there's a lot of pieces that I think a boomer generation, obviously, just because they have more life experience, they can take advantage of. But I think millennials are just, they just are looking at everything and saying like, well, why does it have to be that way? Why can't it be different? And I think that's really interesting. Mm. It's good to look at things from a different angle. You get different answers. I'm curious, what percentage of those, and I know you may not know the total percentage, but what percentage of millennials are actually successful at building that wealth very rapidly, like you had mentioned. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm not sure I have like a specific data point on that, but I just think it's even more of a wealth building mindset. So I think of myself, I still teach at a university virtually in Los Angeles, and I look back at myself, 18, 19, 20 years old, And I mean, sure, I wanted to make a lot of money and be successful, but I wasn't thinking about like rental real estate and day trading. And I wasn't thinking about side hustles and all of those sorts of things. So Mm -hmm. I think more than anything, it's just a wealth building mindset that this generation and younger generations have. Again, whether they're successful with that or not, who knows, but I think it's just even, you know, sort of front of mind. Mm. Yeah, the side hustle, that kind of fits into that gig economy thing, which I think is huge. A lot more of the solopreneur types exactly coming from that. 
I don't see like a ton of like big entrepreneurial business builders. They're there, obviously Zuckerberg, but there is a ton of that side hustle uh, going on. I'm just kind of curious about that because I'm trying to wrap my head around it really, because I'm technically not a boomer, by the way. And I don't identify with the boomer or the millennial necessarily. So I'm kind of, I'm in that stuck generation, right? Between. (laughs) And I as well have taught at university, University of Denver, University of Colorado to the master's level students, like the brightest of the brightest uh, in the finance. And I noticed quite a bit of shifts. Like we had a lot of Chinese students for a while and that kind of went down lately. And the attitudes were different about getting into the world of finance. Some of them and many of them, and maybe it's because I taught the Marsico Fund, which is for the class that manages money for the university. But there are still some people interested in finance and managing money and all that stuff. But it seems like more people are into technology and all of that and business building now, or just how can we make technology work from a business perspective for them personally. But then when I look at clients, like our clients, and I look at their wealthy parents have millennial children, I'm starting to notice that the millennials, the older millennials now, their mindset is a lot like the boomers now. Do you see that? Or or, or am I like smoking crack right now? (laughs) (laughs) No, I think you're right. I don't know. It's just, I think it's just such a fascinating kind of time to be in because I think there is so much change happening in the way we do everything. So yeah, I mean, I think the older millennials are definitely looking at the world differently than let's say, you know, someone who is 18, 19, 20 or younger, that generation wholeheartedly has grown up with technology and Mm -hmm. everything in their face all the time attached to the cell phone. And so they even have a whole different kind of skewed outlook on everything on the world and how we do business and how we operate. One of the things I think was interesting you brought up about that there aren't a lot of entrepreneurs like the Zuckerbergs kind of creating those types of companies. But I think with technology, things like courses and podcasting and all sorts of things have really grown over the last even like five years. And I could probably name you off 10 different friends that I have right now in different social circles who are, you know, between, I would say, 45 and 20, somewhere in that 25 year range. And they're making a million, couple million dollars a year off of teaching courses and all sorts of things like that. And for them, I mean, that's an incredible amount of wealth that they have. And, you know, they don't have to have sort of the headache of running a huge company, but yeah, it's really interesting just to see how all these generations keep innovating and how technology is allowing that to happen. Yeah. The course thing has been phenomenal. There's all these course packages that are out there. If you have a specific skill I've, and you could really turn that into real wealth. I don't know. Do you, what is your sense for how millennials, let's say you're a successful millennial, you start a course business of some sort and you are generating wealth. What are they doing with their money? How are they <laughs> preserving that and creating lasting wealth with that? It's really interesting you bring that up. A few years ago when I was practicing, I was working with a female client who at the time, I think she was early 30s, 31, 32, and she had had a very successful course business and she had been making somewhere between a million to $2.5 million a year for about five years or so, significant amount of money. She was young. Her expenses were relatively low. And when we sat down and had a chat, she said, you know, I'm almost like a little embarrassed to admit this to you, but she's in a mastermind with a lot of other people that were in similar situation. And they were all sharing about what they were doing or not doing with their money. And the mass majority of them had a few million dollars, at least just sitting in a bank account. Because they just have no idea what to do with this money. And, you know, of course, me, I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) No, we got to like multiply that and make that grow and all sorts of things. But I think that there still is that division between making the money, knowing what to do with the money. And specifically, a lot of younger generations, I'll speak specifically to women in general. They don't know who they can trust. Mm. And when it comes to working with a financial expert, and I think a lot of them feel like they're going to get the used card salesman approach. 
And so they just will stack the money up and then really not know what to do with it. I will say now this client fast forward about five years, she's got multiple rental real estate. She's invested, she's spread the money out, but I think to your point, even if you are making a lot of money, there's still this disconnect between what do I do with it? And it Mm. just kind of sit somewhere until somehow they get the information to, to do something better with that cash. So do you get the sense that millennials seem to not trust Wall Street? Yes. So they tend to gravitate towards real estate more. Do you, do you see that as being? Yeah, I think so. I'm kind of seeing like a split, I would say. I do a lot of serving of my podcast listeners, and I'm seeing a pretty wide split between people who are really interested or slash are investing in the market, even if they don't particularly like the way it operates, they see other people accumulating wealth that way. And and then there is a healthy split of people who just want to figure out the whole real estate world and investing in real estate. And they don't want to hear about anything other than that. So I see a real sort of split when it comes to those two. Mm. Yeah. I'm a big believer that there's no perfect asset class. Yeah. So like rental real estate, I've seen people do extremely well with that. And I've seen people get their head handed to them with that. Same thing with stocks. If you don't know what you're doing, like there's no perfect way of doing it. The other thing that I kind of notice, and tell me if I'm off base on this in your experience, because you have more connection with the millennials. I feel like they or I shouldn't say I feel like what I've observed with the, my connections has been that they're not involved as much with stocks because there's a distrust of capitalism to some extent. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that's part of the looking at everything through a different lens. I think that the Wall Street world that is at least portrayed on TV or portrayed in movies, millennials have said, we don't want any part of that. A lot of them have equated wealth with you know being grimy and greedy and all of those sorts of things. I get a lot of listeners questions that ask me basically a version of the same question of, is it bad if I'm wealthy? It's interesting that so many different people and they'll be in all different financial situations will ask me some various version of that question or want to hear my feedback about that. But I think they, yeah, they really repelled against this idea of greed and that if you were wealthy, you were somehow not a good person. And I think we can see that obviously in different political movements that millennials really led the way in. But if you think about it too, a lot of the millennials, especially the younger millennials, were really in impressionable years in 2008, 2009, when all of that happened. And I think they saw a lot of things that really scared them. They didn't know what it all meant, but maybe, you know, parents lost a job or grandparents or just something happened. And I think a lot of them are just really afraid that if they put their money in that same place, that that's going to happen to them as well. So it's just really interesting thinking about that. But yeah, it's this idea that I want to be wealthy. I want financial freedom. I want to have my own choices, but do not put me in that box of capitalism, of greed, of any of that. Mm. It's interesting that greed is associated with capitalism. In other generations, capitalism was equated to a win-win, right? Uh, you created some new product and service. We created this iPhone, came from capitalism, and we're all living this better life, right? Because so everybody's making more money. We have much more a better lifestyle. That's kind of been my viewpoint of capitalism. And I think you could kill the goose that lays the golden eggs if you're not careful. And that's one of the things I think that could be a little bit dangerous in the long run. But I'm also seeing that they're changing their minds on that as they get older, because they're starting to see things differently. And there seems to be a little bit more of a disillusionment also with politics in general, really across a whole spectrum of people. But getting back to the millennials in terms of how they're planning and investing, what would you say their biggest challenges are? Take the average, not the big successful guys, because they're the outliers, right? They're the ones that are on the outside. If you take the bulk of the millennials, what would you say their biggest financial planning and investing challenges are right now? I would say just that there are so many different tugs on the wallet. Most millennials who have gone to school have some sort of sizable student loan debt. 
And that is a big tug for them. And I would say also just living life is really expensive. You just held up an iPhone. I mean, that's a $1,200 purchase that comes out. New ones come out every year and everyone feels like they've got to have the newest, greatest. So we've got that, you know, we've got, I think just with technology and social media, there's so much in your face that you feel like you want slash should, whatever that word is, spend your money mm. on. And so I yeah, think millennials pressure. just have, the, yeah, this huge sort of tug. Also, a lot of them were competing in the job space with older generations that came out of 2008, 2009, and they had to re-engineer their career and get back into the workforce. And then you've got these millennials in there trying to compete with those jobs. And a lot of millennials just weren't probably getting paid what they deserved. I don't know. I mean, we could, you know, flop that one back either way, but I think there's just a lot of wallet pressure for them. And I think it is, it's hard for them to figure out how do I make sense of this and how do I grow wealth. There's a, a lot of questions I get from listeners that talk about, should I even be investing if I have student loan debt? You know, And so I think for them, it's, it's trying to figure out that balance of living life, but also making sure that you're taking care of what you have and multiplying the money that you have. That's interesting. As you were mentioning that, I was thinking about how all these pressures that the millennials have had financially have also coincide with the massive movement towards globalization and a lot of jobs that they normally would have had went to China and to other countries and that hurt them in, in many ways. Yeah. And the expanding debt burden on society on all of that is hurting the tax system, which is also hurting them. Yeah. I see where that pressure is coming from, but at the same time, they're going to inherit a lot of money too. And they're <laughs> inheriting a lot of money right now. What I've noticed is the ones that have been inheriting the money that a lot of them have kind of shied away from learning about financial issues. And then all of a sudden they have this lump sum of money and they're going, I'm not sure what to do, how to deal with it. What would be the first piece of advice you would give a millennial that was in that position? Other than get it, get hire a CFP right away. <laughs> there you go. There's so many different variables to look at. So it'd be looking at what kind of debt do they have? Do they have credit card debt? Do they have expensive debt? Is most of their debt just student loan debt? Looking at those parameters. A lot of millennials have not started investing at all. They've just not felt like they have the cash flow for that. Maybe they do some through a 401k or some through a Roth, but not a sizable amount to make a big difference long-term. So that would obviously be something to look at is how can we take what you got as an inheritance and really grow that over however many years when you show the math to a lot of millennials, I mean, this is obviously people in general, but I've seen this specifically with millennials and the younger generations. When you show them the math of how you could take a, even a relatively small amount of money and in, invest it wisely, you know, how that could really multiply, it really starts to change the game for them. But then I think also, this is probably any generation as they come up, but thinking about the financial risks whether it's health insurance, I mean, obviously health insurance for younger generations is really expensive. It's more expensive than when I was that age. And many of them are having to take health plans, even through employers that have $5,000 annual deductible or something crazy like that. And so making sure you have enough cash to really cover a lot of those risks. So I think it's just a holistic look in humans by nature, we tend to look with very like tunnel vision. And so having somebody also who could help you kind of widen the field and look at all those different puzzle pieces, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of wealth being transferred. I think the next five years, it's going to be even more. And it's really important to empower those younger generations to feel like they can go to people to help them or that there are ways to really grow this money versus like, let's just dump it in AMC stock and cross our fingers and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on too. Well, it feels to me like that sticking your head in the sand is kind of the fault in many cases I'm finding and then getting them educated and motivated. So education and motivation is a real part of this. And I think it's working out pretty well. The other thing I've noticed is a lot of millennials are buying homes now and like some of that small home thing and all that stuff. I mean, do you think that trend is still there? Or do you think millennials are moving more towards the normal way of moving out to the suburbs? And that's what I'm seeing. So I'm just wondering if you're seeing that or not. 
Yeah, I think so. You know, I think there's always going to be that allure for something small or having a, I have a friend who now she's just turned 40 and she actually doesn't have a home at all. So she goes and just house sits kind of all around and is very transient and Back in a world when we could travel, she would spend a couple of months overseas. And I have quite a few people in my life that still really like that life. But I think you're right. I mean, I think the trend is definitely going towards finding a home somewhere that you really want to live and planting those roots down. And I think specifically with the pandemic, really, that's you know, obviously changed how a lot of people see life and mm. realizing that their environment that they're in and where they live and their community and all of those sorts of things really do have an importance to them. So absolutely, I think they're kind of saying, you know what, I actually do kind of want a home base and I'd like it maybe a little bit bigger than like 150 square feet. <laughs> yeah, but I still want that autonomy to travel and move around. Absolutely. Um, If you worry about your investments, need to make complex financial decisions, or pay unnecessary taxes, a lack of proper financial planning and investing may already be costing you a great deal. When you are ready to turn your peace of wealth into peace of mind, go to WealthNetInvest.com and click on the Schedule a Call button to talk to us and get a free consultation today. One thing I've noticed was a relationship with is how well the millennials have a relationship with the opposite sex or whatever, their partner. That has a lot to do with decisions that are made. And I mean, I've been married for a long time and I'm not I was obviously following dating, but I see the trends. Dating is tougher for people in the millennial group, finding the right, because there's so many, there's a lot of dynamics there that have to do with dynamics between females, views of the world have changed and men. And uh, so all of that is leading into different financial decisions and the desire to not buy that home and to do these other things, have my freedom. But I believe from what I've seen is that's affecting relationships in a negative way. Do you think that trend is changing yet? Or do you think it will change? Or is it just going to continue Because it's related to finances, because really the ones that are in more solid relationships, honestly, they generally have better finances. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I think, again, with the pandemic, it really put everything kind of in a giant whirly wind and changed everything on its head. So uh, I think that is changing, but you are right that specifically a lot of millennials have really come into the world where... I'm going to speak through a female lens where it's, sure. we can be anything. We still might be paid a little less. We still got to kind of work on that, Yeah. but we can aspire to be anything. My mom was born in the forties and she looks at me like, why would you want to have a career? You know I mean? It's just, it's just a t- totally different way of looking at life. So I think that, yeah, in relationships specifically, there's always going to be that theme that money is difficult in relationships and people don't want to have those conversations, but how people are meeting is primarily on apps, primarily online. It's a virtual world. It's a different way of doing life. Of course, every couple is different, but I think there is definitely that underlying thread in millennial relationships of just wanting to live life differently and not wanting to just, you know, even if we do have the House, we want to travel and we want to go to concerts and we want to do all of these different things. And so that perhaps is a little bit different than other generations. I think even a lot of millennials maybe are waiting even longer to have kids because they just really want to enjoy life. And that is changing everything. Oh, yeah, that's definitely the trend. The data shows that my mother was in her what 20s, I guess during the women's revolution and all that. My parents divorced when I was pretty young. I don't think I was 11. So it was like instilled in to me by my mother that, and to my sister, that women can be, women are equal and all that stuff. That was a big thing. And I think that did, and they are equal. I mean, I would call them, they're equal, but they're different, right? Right. But it's one of those things where I think it has negatively impacted the relationships in some ways. And that's being reconciled right now. I think that it's being forced to be reconciled because we just need each other, right? Men and women need each other. And that affects money. So it's interesting to see how that kind of works itself out. But I, I made that connection recently because I'm just seeing it more and more. And the older millennials tend to not have that as much, but the younger ones have that issue a little bit more. You could argue this with other generations, but there are a lot of trends where in a relationship, the female is either the breadwinner or the female is the one that manages all the money. 
And so there needs to be different sort of language and education and vocabulary to really speak to that kind of movement that's happening because a lot of women still just don't quite feel, again, they feel like they're going to get the used car salesman kind of approach with a male financial voice that they're going to, and yet they've got their partner or their spouse on the other side. And so I think it's just, it, you're right. It's just so many different things are kind of getting, like you said, like worked out. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that changes money and how that really changes kind of everything, I think. Yeah, it does. The relationships make a big difference. Actually, we have a lot of clients that are just women. They're not married or they were divorced and they remarried. That's a big trend. And then when we've advised a lot of people through divorces, which is always can land in a lot of different ways. But what's interesting about this is that the actual dynamics of those divorces seem to be different. They seem to be different in the older generation. Most of our clients, they're more in their 40s to 65-ish Right. And then on the higher end or on the lower end, those are the older millennials, right? The younger end. I'm just kind of going, you know, give me an idea about the perspective from what I'm seeing. And the student loan thing, that, this is the thing that really baffles me about the student loans. I did an analysis of when I went to school. I paid my way through school. I waited tables. I worked odd jobs, construction, things like that to pay my way through college. I looked at how much I was getting paid when I got started. And I looked at what my actual student loans were and inflation adjusted. They're the same as they are for somebody today. And then I asked myself, well, well why did I, I paid mine off? You know, what, so why was that not a problem for me? And why am I hearing a lot of millennials bellyache over it? And I'm not sure, but I think part of it has to do with what your baseline expectation is. So like my baseline expectation coming from a family from the South side of Chicago was different than somebody who, whose mom and dad were doing well, everything was kind of easy. So I think that might be part of it because when I look at the numbers, they're not that different. What would you say to that? Do you think? What, I would what, agree. Please? I would say that's, that's definitely the case. I think there is something psychological if we're going to the behavioral side of money that happens when you're staring at $50,000 plus of student loan debt that feels insurmountable. And it feels like I must have done something wrong. Was college really worth it? You know, if my student loan debt is a hundred thousand and I'm making 50 or $60,000, like I think just for a lot of millennials in their head, they just can't reconcile a, how they'll ever pay off that debt. But B it's really always comes back to the question of, was this really worth it? I'm personally excited to see if the whole educational system gets really reworked. Mm, right. <laughs> I really think it needs to be reworked. I agree. You know, I mean, I fought in the university I teach at, I fought for even just like a one credit virtual class, just a one credit money class that like everybody would have to take. Like, let's just go through like it could just simply be about saving and spending money or how to track my money. I mean, just something very simplistic. And the politics behind universities just really blows my mind and how we will make somebody take some sort of, I'm just making this up, but let's say some sort of like geology class that has absolutely nothing to do with what you're going to do in life whatsoever, but you're paying a few thousand dollars for that class. But if we're talking about something like a personal finance class that we can pretty much all agree universally, we all need to know how to deal with our money, that, that gets a real pushback. And so I think a lot of people are also looking at college and grad school and things and they, there just has to be a better way to do this. But really, I think I to answer your question, I think it is more that behavioral side of money where when you're looking at the numbers and you're looking at the student loan debt, it just... I think feels so big. And then I think also because there's just so much of a conversation around student loan debt, I think you just, you're sort of almost unconsciously trained to think I'm never going to pay off my student loan debt. My student loans, were they worth it? Were they not worth it? All student loans are terrible. I mean, I think it's just kind of this unconscious bias that we've almost created that puts people in that place. Yeah. It seems like it's almost a feeling of helplessness or that I cannot get over that. Whereas like for me, I didn't have that. Like I felt like determined, like, okay, I'm determined I'm going to pay this off. And it was not a question in my mind as is the government going to pay my loan off? And I'm not trying to get political. I think it was just a different way of looking at it. But inflation adjusted debt to income ratio is almost identical to what an average millennial would have today compared to my generation. So 
I, and I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get political either, but I think there is also, and I see this in the, even the younger, younger generations, there's this expectation that life will just kind of fall at your feet and that a lot of things should just somewhat be given to you. And we can argue both sides of that coin, of course, but I think there's just this expectation of, well, yeah, college should be free. Healthcare right. should be free. All of these things should be accessible to me, but in return, I do not want to have to pay more taxes or I don't want to have to change any of that. So right. that, I think that equation doesn't work, right? It, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> work out, <laughs> but a lot of people I find that are talking about, I agree that college should not cost what it does. I think it's just ridiculous. I agree with um, that. But I think also if we start talking about free education, yeah, there has to be some variables that change in a lot of, especially younger students that I've taught that are really for free education also haven't been out in the world and haven't had taxes taken out of their paycheck yet and had to kind of deal with those aspects of their life. So it's just, I don't know, it's just going to be interesting to see how this all actually does shake out. I was talking to my son. I have 14 year old twins. Oh, 15 year old twins, pardon me, <laughs> <laughs> teenagers and one boy and one girl. And my son, who is taking economics, actually, freshman in high school, he understood that he came to me and told me, he said, you know, okay, so if they make that free, then that's going to decrease the value of a college education. And I'm like, yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you for that, LJ. So I think that you'll get everybody can go, right? And then you'll supply and demand. He just did a basic supply and demand thing for a 15-year-old kid. We kind of don't see the full picture on that. But, you know, and again, I'm trying to have an open mind, though, because when I was in school, when I studied upper level economics in college, the professor I studied under Milton Friedman, the guy who said there's no such thing as free lunch. Yes. So I had a different education, right? But getting back kind of more practical for millennials, I'm always trying to solve problems for millennials. I want to understand how can I help people how can my firm help people that are in that position get on the right track? And since the bulk of people in the millennial group don't qualify for our services, basically, right? That's this hard scenario to be in because every single person is worth the same in my eyes and you want them to be serviced. So I'm saying, how can millennials get on track not using the kind of model that most firms, you said hire a CFP, well, they charge a lot of money. So you mentioned education, and actually I'm going to be doing some education in the high schools. One of my goals for this year, I've already had it lined out. How do you think we should educate the millennials specifically who don't have the money that feel defeated? How do you think we should educate them to turn it around? What are the levers we need to pull and help them with? One of the things that enough people do not teach about are really the behavioral sides of money and understanding how to deal with the stress, anxiety, fear with money, how to really understand how they were taught about money from childhood, how that might impact their decisions and habits and the steps they do or don't take now. I think that's a really important piece of money because if we look back at a lot of millennial and younger parents, those parents have also lived through 2008, 2009, and some really kind of hard blips financially, potentially. And so I think that it's important to really talk about that behavioral side and help people really understand their relationship with money. I think that's really key. But I think that also a lot of teaching around just helping millennials create whether you want to call it a vision or you want to call it goals or you want to call it some, just something tangible. I think if we can change the way we teach where we can really root into figuring out for that person, what do they want their life to look like? What is that sort of scenario? Obviously realizing we're not going to be able to like wave a wand and make that happen. But if individually we can kind of come to the table with something in mind, then we can help teach how to get our money to go around that vision. And rather than just skipping straight ahead to the how to's, I've really seen with millennial and younger generations that if we take that behavioral sort of visioning approach as well, and then we, we let them map out 
this life they want. And then we say, okay, over here's our money. Here's how much we've got right now. Like, how do we best utilize that to get us here? And we make Mm -hmm. more money. How do we then utilize that? There's some light bulb that really goes on. And so I think that we just almost need to change our approach a little bit to how we're educating so that it feels tangible. It feels like a roadmap. It feels personal. I know that so many younger generations are on Instagram and TikTok, and that's where they're learning a lot of their personal finance investing tips. But it's like, well, does that really make sense to you or for you or for your situation? You know, that's really the million dollar question. You and I know the answer is (laughs) no, but I think it's hard to separate that. And so I just see a lot of older generations who do financial education. They really start at the how to's, but I think with younger generations, we almost have to reverse engineer that education scenario. Mm. It's interesting. You mentioned that in our process, we have a form we call the vision builder and it's based on kind of that concept. Because the biggest problem is clarity for not just millennials, but everybody. (laughs) 100%. uh, And once we get clarity, we know that clarity is going to change, right? We'll always be morphing. But if you don't have that clarity, at least attempt it, you won't get anywhere. But it goes beyond that. There's a motivational thing. I think once you got the clarity, then it's like the discipline to actually stick on something that's good for you. And there's a certain percentage of people that will do it. I'm thinking of one client, obviously, I won't mention his name, who's a millennial that came on who did not inherit money or any of that, but he got a tech job, right? And then all of a sudden he started to make a bunch of money. And it was funny because we had to deprogram him and move a bunch of assets out of Robinhood. And you know what? He's doing amazing. And to me, I think that's the payoff. And I'm not saying anything bad against Robinhood. There's a great place for Robinhood. That's not the point. What I meant was, like you mentioned, the meme stocks and all of that, And then getting kind of more of a rational approach to how you invest. And I think that's helpful. But yeah, getting that vision, that makes a ton of sense. I think we have a good opportunity right now to teach people who are younger too, who are not millennials. But I keep struggling with the millennials because I feel like there's a group of millennials that are really moving on track well. And then there's this huge group that's not. And I'm saying, how can we help the ones that aren't? That's why I'm I'm talking to you today because I really, because when I, I had that conversation with you on your podcast, Your questions that you asked, they were like a punch in the face for me because those were the questions that I wasn't able to answer very well. Sorry about that. (laughs) And no, 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 no. It's because our business model, right? Our business model is designed for people who are already on track and they're past the current situation. Like they're past the, how do I make ends meet? I'm in surplus mode. So we got to get them into surplus mode. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's just motivating them to understand what they have and how best to use what they have. Exactly. I was just going to say that it's like, (laughs) so you have to find your unique ability and see how can I get the most market value from my unique ability? And it's okay. It's okay. And it's not greed because you're basically increasing. I think there needs to be a mindset change. You are increasing value for people and you're getting compensated for it. It's win-win. There's not a single pie that shrinks. If I get somebody else loses, the pie gets bigger because of your efforts as a millennial in your position. And that's, I think if if I could wave a magic wand, that would be what I would hopefully instill in millennials that are not being able to make ends meet. I agree. Yeah. I'm with you on that waving the wand. Happy to do it with you. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Hey, listen, where can we send people to learn more about you and your work and all the things that you're up to? Yeah, well, I would love anyone to hop on over to our podcast is called Millennial Money. It's on any podcast player. We have uh, over 770 some odd episodes that we've done over the years. And so there is literally an episode for everyone. Our show motto is that money touches all aspects of life. So We need to talk about all those aspects of life. So you can hop on over there. You can also head to our website, which is mmoneypodcast.com. And on there, you can find all sorts of things about me and what I'm up to as well. We'll get that in the show notes. Thanks again for being on the podcast. It's been great. I learned a ton talking to you. Yes, you as well. Great. Talk to you later. 
for the latest episode of the Market Call Show, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Go to marketcallshow.com for all our past episodes and sign up to get alerts for new episodes. If you enjoy the content of this episode, please leave us a five-star review and comments. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure.